With the rise of extraction shooters now at an all-time high, with not just the first-in-class Tarkov, but many other titles rising to prominence attempting to cash in on the Battle Royale turned extraction shooter craze. From the creators of Spec Ops The Line, The Cycle, and then named The Cycle Frontier, was first a competitive quester, later turned an extraction PvPvE shooter that originally launched back in 2019. The Cycle would go on to live for three seasons before suddenly The Cycle Frontier, over a short span of months, was erected and launched yet again, this time with a new identity in 2022. This means that the story of The Cycle is actually the story of two different designs and thus games launched at different times. This means it's a two-in-one episode technically, detectives. <laughs> Normally in the Death of the Game series, we cover one game or company and diagnose the largest contributing reasons for the game or company's failures or shudderings. This episode we're covering two games in one, and we're not talking about sequels either. These two different worlds of the same core game make for quite an interesting story that I hope you guys will enjoy as much as I did. This one is a doozy though, so make sure to pay close attention to the clues as they appear, including any bits of evidence. If you miss anything though, at the end we do a final deduction where we cover it all again in everyone's favorite detective segment. With the help of both experienced detectives and developers on this in nearly all episodes, we drive towards the ultimate truth as best as we can. For only the truth remains. Without further ado, let's cover our very first extraction shooter on the channel. I'd like to welcome the video sponsor, Geology. Geology is a 24-time award-winning skin, hair, body, and care company recognized in Men's Health, Hype Beast, Birdie, Esquire, Ask Men, and Oprah Daily Grooming Awards. Their products are built around just a handful of powerful but proven ingredients that have been trusted by dermatologists for decades. Geology is celebrating its five-year anniversary with their biggest offer yet. Take 70% off of your personalized skincare trial set and get up to an additional 30% off add-ons when added to the trial. That means that you're getting over $50 in products for just $15. 70% off of a 30-day sample set, plus you get an additional 30% off of the add-ons. Geology's classic everyday face wash for me is probably my favorite. It's the most simple, but it gets the job done. It makes my skin feel great, not oily, and not dry either. As somebody who's right in between on that spectrum, that's helpful for me. Geology can help you fight acne, reduce oiliness, prevent wrinkles, combat dark or puffy under eyes, have smoother and hydrated skin, and target signs of aging. Geology creates simple but effective skincare and hair care routines customized just for you with ingredients that are proven to work. Not only is Geology the best in the skincare game, they also have released a ton of new amazing hair, body, and other skin products. Whatever you need, Geology has you covered. From their affordable skin revitalizing, vitamin C and E, Feraluc Acid Serum, to their two-time award-winning co-wash, to their brand new body care line and body wash and deodorant, which I personally really enjoy the scent on the deodorant, by the way. With all of this, it takes care of all of your bathroom needs. Head to the link in the description, or scan the QR code on screen and use code NERD70, and they will give you an exclusive 70% off of their award-winning skincare trial set. On top of that, you can save big on the add-on products of your choice when you add it to your trial. Hurry now, because this is a limited offer. And thank you to Geology for sponsoring this video. The story of the cycle and the cycle frontier begins with its developers, Yeager Development. Following their lukewarm launch and development of another title, Dreadnought, a combat flight simulator. This was their second project Jaeger was juggling at the time, the other being the famously failed Dead Island 2 project, or should I say famously shelved repeatedly to the point that Jaeger was just straight pulled from development. Dead Island 2 would eventually come out, but not involving Jaeger, making technically the second game in a row they were sort of pulled from. After the cancellation of Dead Island 2 from Jaeger, and the not-so-great launch of Dreadnought, which required them to shift the game to another developer in the end, Jaeger was looking to, yet again, juggle two games in development in an attempt to find success. This is the beginning of our story, as Project Prospect would take hold in 2017 according to my sources. The initial idea of Prospect was akin to something like Cliff Pazinski's Radical Heights, rapid-fire development attempting to cash in on a successful trend. Radical Heights is something that we have talked about on the series, and on the channel as well. Jaeger would publicly announce the cycle, July 2018, after around 6-12 to 12 months of development. The game would then enter a playable alpha to just a select few. The details released early on were comparable to Hunt Showdown, and they were calling the game a competitive quester. 
as well as an open world blend of FPS matches and quest objectives. There wasn't any gameplay released, but there were some aspects up to what that would entail that were being explained as well, such as you being dropped on a planet dubbed Fortuna 3 and competing against 19 other players for contracts and each match lasting about 20 minutes. While the alpha was reportedly raw, it was a good proof of concept and Jaeger and early supporters felt that there was something there. Hunt Showdown was a good comparison, as that game had more PvE elements than perhaps Tarkov, one of the original extraction shooters. Both of these were big points of inspiration going forward for the cycle, just in different spurts. According to my sources, Jaeger didn't have a solidified vision for what the cycle was yet, but they were getting some success from those that they were showing the game to, so they were marching on regardless. Jaeger would reportedly be approached by Epic Games concerning joining their newly launched game marketplace, the Epic Store. This would secure Jaeger much needed funding, which is why many smaller developers would also make a similar move. Jaeger didn't just take the deal for money though. According to my sources, they also did such as they felt that there would be less competition there if the platform were to excel, which is still kind of money, but you get the distinction, I'm sure. With the new exclusive deal in hand, the cycle, as it was originally dubbed, would launch September 12th, 2019. By 2020, the cycle had seen three different seasons, and while that might have been seen as a sign of success, what happened next put everything regarding the game and its future in jeopardy. First, the cycle would leave exclusivity on Epic and announce the desire to launch on Steam. The controversial thing about that is that the original reason for Jaeger not launching on Steam in the first place was due to getting a lucrative Epic deal. The problem arises because they actually did their initial testing on Steam, so some fans, Steam fans, feel betrayed by this sort of thing, as silly as it might sound. So there was either a small previous cycle audience remaining there, or a new one to try to attract your game to, making the launch on Steam still seem like a good decision. The really controversial part happened behind the scenes after the announcements were made. Jaeger would express a desire to shift the game to something more akin to a, a full-blown extraction shooter, something more akin to Tarkov, which had been raking in success by the 2020s. In this still live video concerning Jaeger, the developers are shown drinking alcohol as they effectively announce the newest build and direction of the game, painting a slightly bleak scene. While the transition initially was set to take just under the quarter of the year, it would end up taking a full year. While the transition was hated across multiple messaging boards, according to my sources it was needed, according to those in charge, because the game hadn't yet been profitable. It's no mystery that these changes seem to come to the forefront after Tencent would acquire a majority stake in Jaeger June 22nd, 2021. According to a few of my sources, these changes were meant to keep the cycle alive with a newly injected Tencent support. The NDA for the cycle now would be dubbed Cycle Frontier and would be dropped October 7th, 2021. The game had changed now, just like the early footage had showcased. The game looked a lot more like its competitors. During this time, Summit and Shroud would play the game and express great interest in the early goings of the Cycle Frontier, showing the game to an all-new massive audience pretty much for the first time ever. By March 2022, the Cycle Frontier had fully shifted from something more akin to a PvPvE quester shooter to what many were calling Tarkov Light. The problem with this, according to many fans protesting the changes and shift, was that catering to an audience who can just return back to their game when they want to, seems kind of dubious, which was fair criticism. The fans of the cycle wanted the cycle, as it was originally more so conceived, they wanted something more unique, a cool alternative to Tarkov, but not Tarkov itself. While it goes without saying that Jaeger shifted the game's design and development to be more in alignment with Tarkov, to be fair, their original vision wasn't ever quite solidified. They were kind of just moving to whatever was successful at the time. That means that they were doing what I like to call what works, which is good in many fields, but probably not in an online multiplayer setting. Figuring out as things go is just expensive and a risky endeavor. But Jaeger and their attempt to keep the cycle alive were committed to the new changes, and thus its new identity. For those who didn't have the chance to play the game or watch any of the gameplay I have on screen or that exists on YouTube concerning it, the old cycle was uniquely different in the sense that it didn't feel nearly as zero-sum, and that's a huge part of building a shooter that people can return to. If things become too zero-sum and too hard to buy into and to start your enjoyment process, eventually you're just going to face burnout. This is why many Tarkov-style shooters have seasons that wipe to try to artificially fix this issue in the fact that there isn't long-term progression systems in gameplay. 
The cycle was a hard buy-in as a player, as it took you time to gear up and level your character, while also competing against other characters who already did that. Throw in solo players and you have a recipe for what we call in gaming, pub stomping. There were some serious issues going forward concerning the new version of the cycle, but details concerning the monetization would be released April 2022. Monetization was standard fare for an online shooter at this point, with cosmetic shops and a battle pass, in this case, dubbed Fortuna Pass. What was unique about the monetization in a game like The Cycle was the fact that there was an ability to purchase insurance on your items so you didn't lose them, or at least not the full value of them. While it's a lengthy and complex monetization scheme, the Cycle Frontier's monetization wasn't too egregious in my opinion. Also explained during this release was that Jaeger reportedly had over a hundred developers working on the project too. The final closed beta would end sometime in May of 2022, however there is more bad news behind the scenes. According to my sources, although developers were well aware of the issues with cheap protection and cheap prevention, leadership would ultimately push past this and their concerns in favor of launching the game on their schedule the following month. This created a tremendous crunch which strained some Jaeger developers so much that they would leave the company. Pushing launch over focusing on cheap prevention would end up being a catastrophic failure of a decision, but worse, one that leadership was well aware of. Multiple of my sources would corroborate with this. Jaeger would push on regardless and launch The Cycle Frontier June 8th, 2022 on Steam and PC. The Cycle Frontier, though, wouldn't score too well, reaching a 59 out of 100 on aggregate review website Metacritic. PC Gamer in their review would grade the game at a 55 out of 100 and would state that The Cycle Frontier is well polished but undone by tedium and lack of imagination. Lingering question through my hours of boredom and frustration was, who is this for? Players seeking tense competitive stakeouts and shootings may have many games they can play that aren't burdened by the sheer tedium of hovering over loads of meager rocks. Those who love the treadmill of grinding and upgrading can play games with vastly more interesting rewards, that don't saddle that loop with the perils of being blown away by a player with more time or money. While some of that sounds like just being a complaint of the style of game it is, which I always find to be kind of strange complaints, the rest of the criticism was pretty fair. The reception at launch was a heavy blow to the cycle frontier. Technically speaking, it had a better reception the first time which was puzzling in many ways, but more importantly, not a good sign of what was to come for the game. Having a poor critical reception isn't enough to tank your game. Sometimes players can just disagree with critics after all. The problem was that players weren't scoring it that much better. The Cycle Frontier would score a 5.2 out of 10 from users on Metacritic and a 61% on Steam reviews overall. These numbers for an underbaked online multiplayer shooter would prove quite difficult to recover from, because multiplayer players are easily the most fickle, and when they got a whiff of the reviews, many would unfortunately, for Jaeger, steer clear of the game. Season 1 would begin June 22nd, and quite quickly the biggest issues in the Psycho Frontier would rear their head, some that had been there from the very beginning. For starters, the game was very poor performing, not running the most smoothly. I mean, you can even see frame drops when you're watching gameplay trailers that are official gameplay trailers, which is never a good sign. But more than that, the crashes that would be inevitably putting you out of luck and gear was the issues of cheating and the sheer variety of abundance of such. For example, it wasn't just the usual suspects aimbotting an infinite health that could cause problems. It was hacks designed to find players and know what their inventory and gear was before having to fight or loot them. This would allow hackers to easily pinpoint targets and harass and kill them, further creating frustration amongst players who did start to accomplish levels of success, leading to a severe burnout. Because the Cycle Frontier was free to play, hackers had an easy and abundant access to the game, no barriers to prevent them. Jaeger in this case was informed though, not only did they have Tarkov to inform them, a game that's not free by the way, they knew early on that launching the game without hack protection could be an issue, and they chose to launch the game early instead of fixing the said issue. Famous FPS player Shroud even expressed his frustration over the hacking that eventually would make him quit the game. As Shroud points out, some of the cheaters had been cheating for over a week long, a true death knell in a serious online multiplayer game. While the Cycle Frontier would eventually curb much of the hacking, it would until Season 2, and then it would only last a single season, as I will explain later on. TCF would face server downtime in August of 2022, also contributing to a large reason that players were just quitting the game. 
While the population had peaked at 40,000 players, by August they were already down to 9,000 players. Season 2 would be the best season in the Cycle Frontier's history, as it would be the season that they would introduce Bifron Technologies anti-cheat protection. The changes were noticeable too, as many hackers were now being banned very promptly. Jaeger would also add hacker compensation, which is where if you're killed by a player who is hacking, you can get some of your gear back. Sadly, this is not a very publicized or popular moment for the game, meaning that although Season 2 was the best for the game, or at least the new game, it wasn't being played by enough players to make a significant difference. And for those players who did join in, they were getting burnt out due to the lack of content in the launched game, and other issues that we will cover shortly. The issue of a lack of content is a normal issue that plagues many growing multiplayer games, so it's not that unique. The problem in the Psycho Frontier was it already was years old. <laughs> but clearly being developed as it was being played in unison, which made it even years later feel like it had very little in the way of content. What new content was added, Ferris Island, people hated it because it was boring and it didn't add much in the overall gameplay for the cycle. It was also primarily reserved for the most hardcore and grinded players, making it hard for new players to even enjoy the content. Unbeknownst to most, Jaeger would undergo a serious downsizing in October of 2022, concerning the team working on the cycle. I was told by multiple sources that the team was shrunk down to roughly 40 developers. That means that they would lose about 60 plus developers shifting from the project. The only thing I can possibly imagine doing this for is picking up development on another game, which we will talk about shortly. Season 3 would hit March 29th, 2023, and bring in the greatest changes for the game's history yet. Not only would the economy be completely overhauled, so would the quest system and the removal of wipes period in the game. To elaborate, extraction and survival style shooters or games usually have wipe cycles that last seasons because the games are more so designed to experience those early game experiences and struggle and then rinse and repeat, lacking true long-term progression. While this is an issue for many players like myself, the extraction shooter and survival shooter genres are quite used to wipe cycles. But if you start to appeal to other types of players, it's very likely that those players are going to be less familiar or friendly with the concept. And therein lies the problem. The Tarkov fans and industry standard fans expect wipes and are used to them. However, the new audience that the Cycle Frontier was attracting wasn't just that audience. It wasn't even that audience originally. In fact, the Cycle Frontier was made to attract the Tarkov audience, and yet it was still having issues with having not attracted just a Tarkov audience. So you effectively had an audience and development team surfacing two different ideas and concepts throughout the history of the game, and yet finally making the decision to choose a direction all the way in Season 3, which is technically Season 6. Although the population would greatly rebound following the changes, going from nearly 2,600 players to 10,000 players peak, the numbers would drop down shortly after, citing most of the same issues people were having from the start. Performance was better now, but still not good enough for the state of the game, and worse, cheating was back and in full force. That's because, as I was told by my sources, the cheap protection company working with Jaeger on the Cycle Frontier was hired and gobbled up by Mega Giant Roblox. Yep, that Roblox. So in a weird way, you can blame Roblox for this game failing. <laughs> Just kidding. But Jaeger had no backup plans, and thus when they lost their cheap protection that had been doing wonders for them, it effectively killed the game for sure in the eyes of the player base and community. The problem is that there wasn't another opportunity for another relaunch to fix the problems anymore. Behind the scenes, January of 2023 was another big month in the game's history. The Cycle's remaining team members, or most of them, would be shifted to work on the next Dune game, Dune Awakening. While this might seem random as hell, as many of you can basically probably find no trace of this online, and Funcom is the developer reportedly working on the game, well, check out the Steam DB link. Specifically, zoom in on the branches. Enhance. Notice something interesting about this, detectives? I bet you did. This confirms my sources, who state that although it wasn't stated that the Cycle Frontier was being shelved yet, it effectively was behind the scenes, while publicly the game released fewer and smaller updates. The creature revamp, for example, would hit in May of 2023, and this one is bizarre to me. The creatures were always frankly a, a nuisance in the game, and offered very little in the way of challenge or fun obstacles. So the revamp would add some much needed changes to the creatures, but my perplexity comes more from the fact that why did it come so late? <laughs> How are you going to be making gore changes in a game a year later? No, three years later. Because you never finished making your core game. You just had to monetize it right away though. So Jaeger chose their fate, like many other early access titles that are overexposed and underdeliver. 
Things were looking really dire for the cycle frontier. An internal meeting took place May 24th, 2023, where it was basically determined that the game was in a do or die situation. According to multiple sources, the ultimate consensus was to choose to scrap the game and move on to another project or two. Which means that the sunset announcement that would tragically but not entirely surprisingly hit even for the players of the game, the web June 28th, 2023, Jaeger would express that this would be the game's final patch coming up and the servers would shut down officially September 27th, 2023. In one of the most bizarre and tone-deaf blog posts, Jaeger expresses that they can't keep the game alive because running servers cost money which makes it feel like they're better off probably not mentioning that part. Jaeger did at least admit that Season 3 was the reaction to Season 2 not being the game saver season that it needed to be, which just feels odd to me given the context and the quality of the game. It needed far more time, and putting that level of expectation on a single season just seemed a bit silly. Removing the wipes and overhauling the game in ways that Season 3 was trying to do and did was the final last-ditch effort, but it failed. To me, that seems more like a development studio being desperate and just forcing changes without a whole lot of thought process or setup behind it. But that should be par for the course, concerning that the ultimate goal of the Psycho Frontier was to follow a trend. Without a unified vision or goal and someone willing to put their name on the line for such, it felt like a bunch of cooks doing whatever they could to make the food better. Problem is, is that they were probably baking more than they were cooking. This means that mistakes were already made in preparation, much before the failure of Season 3 or Season 2. They wouldn't have had to overhaul their game so tremendously if that wasn't the case. Or that just confirms that they weren't really having a unified vision. Both are incredibly damning. Oh yeah, and one last thing, which I'm seriously gonna put as a reason, is grenade spam. Seriously, grenade spam? Grenade spam? Why the hell can you grenade spam in a game where you can lose your stuff? Like, what? With the music playing in the background, detectives, it means that it's time for the final deduction. Every detective's favorite moment of triumph for we all take the gathered clues thus far and put the case to rest. Why did the Psycho Frontier die? Well, if you couldn't deduce on your own, hackers. It was free to play. It was an unfinished and underpolished game. It had an inconsistent vision and design. Powerful players eat everyone. Grenade spam, like, seriously? Developers just gave up on the project. This case was full of all kinds of twists and turns, and backdoor happenings, and I thoroughly enjoyed every second of it. Without getting developer and player testimonies on projects like this, we likely would have only scratched the surface of the story of the Cycle Frontier. So I actually want to take this time to thank everyone for their contributions on this video, as I really enjoyed making it, and for future videos as well. While the story on the Psycho Frontier wasn't exactly exciting or memorable past the big failure points where it faded mostly into obscurity, right, talking about the actual game, it had moments where it really did look like it could have been a unique alternative to Tarkov and games like that, but in the end it morphed so much into Tarkov that it just couldn't stand up to the Titan anymore and get out of its shadow. Thanks for watching.